Today's sermon, who has amazing faith? Who has amazing faith? And you can go ahead and start asking yourself these questions as we prepare to move into the scripture today. Ask yourself, do I have amazing faith? Do you? How's your faith? Pretty amazing? Um, how does Jesus assess your faith? How does Jesus, if Jesus were to give you a grade on your faith, A plus, honors roll, yes, on the faith, or maybe B, C, we start going, I don't want to go too far below that, but um, how does Jesus assess your faith? Now, I'm going to give you a spectrum here today. On the one hand, we're going to have astounding unbelief, okay, all the way over to astounding unbelief, and that would definitely be at the extreme level of failure F, okay, astounding unbelief. And then we can go all the way over to, follow me over here, to amazing faith, faith that even amazes Jesus. Where would you place yourself today, in the last few months, in your faith grade? Would you be pretty close over here to faith that even amazes Jesus? I hope you would. Uh, we're going to talk about that today. Now, let's remember what faith is. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. In other words, grace is the, the means of salvation, the instrument through which we receive it, faith. You've been saved by grace through faith. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God. That means not only the grace, but also faith. Faith is a gift of God. Faith, God gives us. We don't double down on ourselves and make us believe more because we're just going to make it happen. No, no, it's a gift from God to which we respond. Faith is a gift. Now, ask yourself this. Am I seeking faith? Is my main priority in life to seek faith? I want to encourage you to have that as your main priority. I want to at least move it up to scale. When you wake up in the morning, when you move through your day, when you're in classes, when you're in social situations, are you seeking and even praying for faith? When you're receiving all kinds of inundative uh, you know, messages on your cell phone and on social media, are you instead asking for faith instead of what everybody else is saying? Hmm? Are you asking for faith, asking God for it? Are you living by it, by faith? It's a way to live. Are you growing in faith? I mean, let's just do, do an honest assessment of yourself. Over the last few weeks, has your faith grown? And I can guarantee you this, if your faith is growing, you're going to increasingly be sharing your faith with others in testimony, in encouragement, in a different way of looking at things than most people do, than most social media is going to have for you. So as we enter today's message, this is my basic question for you to reflect on. We'll come back to it at the end of the sermon as well. Ask yourself, do I have amazing faith? So our scripture, our primary scripture for today, we return to Luke's gospel. We're working our way through, preaching our way through Luke's gospel. We're going to be reading today from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. And then I've also included a little passage from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, as a point of reference for, we're going to hear about a centurion, so it kind of applies to that exchange between Jesus and this centurion who's going to believe. Hear now God's word from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When he, this means Jesus, had completed all his teaching, the term there is Raymond, it means like an extensive like corpus of instruction, all his teaching in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. That's his home base town where he, he's basing his ministry out of at this stage of his ministry. Now, now, a centurion's servant, who was highly valued by him, was sick and at the point of dying. When he, when the centurion, heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come to and, and save, diosose, it's a salvation word, his servant. 
And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you grant this for him. Because he loves our nation and himself has built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. But already, when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself because I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, neither did I count myself worthy to come to you, but say a word and my servant shall be healed. For even I am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard these things, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him said, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant healthy, whole. And then to John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, he, this means Jesus, the Word incarnate, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But all who received him, to those believing in his name, his name which means the Lord who saves us, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Who has amazing faith? Now, when Jesus heard these things, he was amazed at him, at the centurion. And turning to the crowd following him, said, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. This is from Luke chapter 7, verse 9. You see a parallel passage in Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, verse 10. Let me tell you, in case you don't know, if you start reading through the gospels, you will learn that Jesus often, frequently amazed people. People are just totally amazed by what Jesus says. They're astounded at the authority of his teaching. They're astounded at the works that he does, the miracles that he does. They're astounded in the way he carries himself. They're astounded that he claims no earthly possessions, but just moves around trusting in the Father totally. You know, doesn't have a house in which to, to, to base himself, doesn't have clothes <laughs> other than what's on his back. You know, Jesus often amazed people. But... Bible nerds, you're going to like this. You, you better get the answer right now, okay? But the Gospels record only two times when Jesus was amazed. Falmazil is the, is the term here. That's the Greek term, okay? Only two times Jesus was amazed. And I've already given it to you basically in the spectrum. Let's fill in the blanks. I hope you can follow along with the notes and fill in the blanks. There's two times when Jesus was amazed at people. On the one end of the spectrum, we read about this in Mark chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus was amazed at something, the something of his hometown folks in Nazareth. Can you fill in the blank? Jesus was amazed at how well they sang. Why are you would like that, right? Jesus was amazed at the uh, harmony, at the food that they produced at the fellowship dinner. Is that, what Je is that what amazed Jesus? No. It goes a little bit worse than that. A lot worse than that. Jesus was amazed at the unbelief. You can fill it in. At the unbelief of the people of his hometown, Nazareth. I mean, here he is, <laughs> the Messiah has grown up with them. He's, you know, everybody all Galilee is talking about all his amazing teaching and miracles, and he comes home, and, you know, there's almost a wall of separation even to receiving his grace and miracles there in Nazareth. He is astounded, about <laughs> I mean, he's 
blown away at how much they don't believe. You don't want to be over there. <laughs> don't go there. Okay. And then, of course, the other time, I hope you can get this answer right. You should be able to get 50% of this quiz right because we just read the entire scripture about it. Jesus is also amazed at the centurion's what? His faith, and the ESV, for whatever reason, doesn't highlight this. It's there in the Greek. His great faith. His great faith in Luke chapter 7. Verse 9, Jesus, if you'll remember, if you know the Gospels, Jesus sometimes refers to the puniness of his disciples' faith. O ye of little faith, but O you of little faith. Jesus says that a number of times. It's possible, I, I don't want to get personal with you, but it's possible Jesus occasionally turns to you and says, O you of little faith, O, o Martin of little faith. But in the account of the centurion, we encounter the one time in the Gospels, Matthew 8, Luke 7, when Jesus refers to someone's faith as being great, much, much faith. What is faith? Steve Zeisler refers to faith as the willingness to bet your life on the promises and the character of God. Do you do that when things don't turn out the way you thought they would? When the relationship breaks up? When the marriage is in trouble? When you're not getting what you want? When the doctor comes back and says it's stage four and there is no treatment? Do you bet your life on the promises and the character of God despite what seems to be inundating your fleshly eyes and heart. Faith is a gift from God. So again, I want to ask yourself, ask yourself, am I seeking faith? Because God's going to have to give it to me. I can't double down and say, just be optimistic, just kind of see through, be really good. No, 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 you're, you're not going to produce it out of your flesh. It's going to come from God. Now, you, you want to actively receive it and seek it, but it's going to be coming from God. True faith. Am I asking God for the gift of faith? And am I then living according to faith? Am I living according to faith? Am I growing by faith? And am I sharing faith? And again, I'm telling you, the fruit will show what's going on with the roots. If you're growing in faith, other people are going to know it. It's, it's going to glow forth from you, and you're going to share it with others. People are going to be who themselves are seeking faith will gravitate towards you and want to have your prayers for them, want to hear what you say about what's going on in this issue or that issue, at school, at work, wherever. Let's dig into our scripture for today. Our primary passage from Luke 7. Uh, when he had completed, fulfilled all his teaching in the hearing, of course, of the people. Let's look at this. When he, this means Jesus, had completed, a play rosen, okay? He had fulfilled. You're, you're, you're really supposed to catch that. I know most translations are not getting that for you, but I'm telling you, when I look at the Greek, it's clear Luke is highlighting this for us. He had fulfilled all his teaching. And, and therefore, I'm reading this. I don't see this in any commentaries, but I'm reading this to include all the way back, not only, uh, obviously, the Sermon on the Level. Most commentaries are going to tell you that, the one that um, immediately preceded this passage. Okay, So it's talking about what he taught at the end of what we read in Luke chapter 6. But I'm going back. Remember the seven-unit segment uh, with, with the markers that Luke gives us, the three Aginato passages? the one central one, Chi Metatalta, after these things in the middle, where Jesus says, I am the physician, I'm coming to heal people. Those who are well think they have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I've come not to call the righteous, the so-called righteous, but sinners to repentance. Remember, that's the central passage. And then the three other Aginato passages, all the way through that sequence of seven 
We talked about seven last week. It's not by accident. Luke gives us seven segments here. But I'm going out, that's five through the middle of six. But I think this goes all the way back to four and the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, including when he preaches at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Remember the seven unit sequence, five, chapter five, verse one through seven, six, 17. But then look at this, all the way back to Luke 4, 21. This is a marker in the way Luke is writing this. Look at this. When Jesus reads Isaiah 61, verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2, and he sits down after reading from the scroll, what does he say? He says, today, this scripture has been what? Fulfilled in your hearing. Luke is linking us from 7-1 back to 421. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, in your ears. So back to our passage. When he had fulfilled all his teaching, not just the sermon on the level, but the whole sweep of phase one of his public ministry, all his teaching, the corpus of it, in the hearing, we're supposed to catch that one too, a koas of the people, what did Jesus say as he closed out the Sermon on the Level? Everyone who comes to me and does what? Hears. A kuon, my words, and does them. Hear. And when he says hear, he means not just like hear some noise and forget about it. What did the preacher preach about? I don't know. It was 15 minutes ago. I can't remember anything. No, no. Actually takes it in. Whoever comes to me and hears my words, and therefore does them. So, when Jesus had completed all his teaching in the hearing of the people, we're looking back at Luke chapters 4 through 6, and what are those, what does that part of the gospel teach us about what it means to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, to be a disciple? Well, here are just a few highlights. Number one, Salvation and true discipleship include being humble, humility, include faith. Jesus is very much emphasizing faith, selflessness, and poverty in relation to God. Flowing from that, self-acknowledged sick people, sinners, needing the physician. Jesus says right in the middle of the seven units, you know, when he, when he has the big feast with uh, Levi, the tax collector, he, he, says, he says to the Pharisees who are so freaked out that Jesus is socializing with sinners, he says, look, the self-righteous people, those who are well, have no need of the physician, but those who are sick. I've come not to call these so-called righteous. If you think you're a good church person and don't really need Jesus because you've already got it all lined up, <laughs> you don't need me, Jesus says. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Well, I don't need to repent. I've never really done anything wrong. Well, apparently, you're not open to Jesus. So, self-acknowledged sick people or sinners needing repentance, which, of course, is a bridge to our passage for today, the sick servant of the centurion, Compassion, mercy, and this is really interesting. Extreme, extravagant love and giving. By the same measure you give, Jesus says, it's going to be given back to you. All these aspects that I'm highlighting to you are going to come through this segment we've read today. So let's dig in a little bit more. Luke chapter 7, verse 3. I've already highlighted the hearing. Now catch this in Luke 7, verse 3. When the centurion did what? You can fill in the blank. I'm going to give it to you. When the centurion heard. Catch that? When the centurion heard about Jesus. There were thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people hearing about this crazy rabbi up in Galilee doing all these miracles. A lot of them don't act on it. Do you act on what you've heard about Jesus? 
when the centurion heard, he acted. Because he's really hearing. He sent elders of the Jews to Jesus because the centurion has this uh, sick servant asking Jesus to come and save his servant. Now he's talking about literally save him from death, but of course this is almost like a parable or a metaphor for what's really going on. Okay, in Luke, highlight, highlight, highlight Luke. Uh, in Luke, this is the first individually identified Gentile, and I would go ahead and expand it to two, the first individually identified Gentiles who are the recipients of a miracle of Jesus and who are the recipients of clear, direct outreach of the saving gospel of Jesus. First public ministry miracle recording in Luke that extends to Gentiles, the centurion and his servant. I would just go ahead and clarify, he, you know, most, uh, like, I'm just, like, most Bible commentaries are going to say, well, this is the first Gentile who's healed. No, not really, because if you look back at, for instance, just, all, just shortly back to Luke 6, 17, and 18, great multitudes were coming to Jesus, including people from Tyre and Sidon. That means primarily Gentiles from Tyre and Sidon are coming to Jesus to hear his teaching and be healed. These are the first Gentiles who are highlighted, though. By Luke, highlighted by Luke, individually. Um, let me go ahead and say something else about this centurion. Um, is he Roman? We don't know that. God's word through Luke apparently is not interested in clarifying that. Um, at this point in history, Galilee is not directly under Roman control, but is under the control of Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. So there are soldiers there. It's a big tax collection center, you know, North Galilee, um, Capernaum. So there's, there's reasons for a centurion to be there. They're collecting a lot of money there, okay? Crossroads, I've talked about this earlier in this series. Uh, but we don't know, is he specifically Roman? We don't know that. If he's, if he's specifically under Rome, he would be coming over from Caesarea Maritima on some kind of assignment. If he's under Herod Antipas, he's not necessarily Roman. Okay? He's some kind of Gentile. Read some commentaries or people saying things even like, in, kind of surprisingly, John MacArthur is usually pretty conservative, kind of bit on that concept that somebody threw out decades ago that he may indeed be Samaritan, and there are Samaritans definitely serving in the Roman army, the extended international Roman army, but I'm pretty sure if Luke is aware that this is a Samaritan, he would highlight it, because he does elsewhere, wherever you're dealing with Samaritan. I don't think he's a Samaritan. He may or may not be Roman. The point is, he's Gentile, and the servant serving under his house is going to be Gentile. Let's pull back big picture for a minute, though. Application. Faith, what is faith? Not only is it a gift of God, it's also a way of seeing. The Bible teaches us that faith is a way of seeing. Understanding yourself, what is going on in the world around you with people you love. Understanding what's going on in other ways in the world. Faith is a way of seeing. The way the world sees in general, the way most people you know see, the Bible calls blindness. It's the seeing of the flesh. The way according to the Bible, most religious people, see, most Jews in the day of Jesus, and by extension, possibly many so-called church people, see, is also blindness. Faith is seeing not by the fleshly eyes, but through the gift of God, his vision. This is the way the saved or the elect of God see with eyes of faith. That's why Paul refers to it that way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's why Hebrews chapter 11 refers to it this way. Faith is a way of seeing. So back to our story, let's look at three ways of seeing. Number one, the Jewish elders' way of seeing things. Number two, the centurion's way of seeing things. And number three, Jesus' way of seeing things. Let's look at the elders. 
they have a religious heart. Is all you have a religious heart? I hope, I pray, you have more than a religious heart. Because they have a religious heart, it turns out their heart is hard, and that affects the way they see. The way they view things is based on a merit calculation. They believe that we're in a transactional arrangement with God, not a covenant of grace, but a transactional arrangement where, you know, if we do the right things, I pray so God owes me to heal this person I'm praying about. If I give, if I serve, God owes me to confirm to me that I'm a good Christian. Okay, that's the way they view things. Merit calculation. And they come to Jesus and they say, this centurion, he is worthy. The term they use there is axios. Very interesting. This is Greco-Roman terminology in public uh, discourse and in governmental relationship. They say, you owe it to him to fix this guy's servant because you should grant it to him just like the governor should grant something to him. That's the term they use, axios. It's legal terminology in the Greek. You deserve to, he deserves to have you grant this to him. Really interesting, because he's done all these good things. He's done the right things. I mean, he's been more than generous. So, before I get off of the elders, notice this. Do they know, do they presume that Jesus can heal this man? Yes! Do they know that Jesus somehow has miraculous saving healing power? Yes! Do they know their scriptures? Yes, they're the elders. Is it not obvious that they should connect the dots and not be coming to Jesus bossing him around but saying, wait a minute, you are the Messiah. You are manifesting signs of God's coming in his kingdom. We bow down before you and give our lives to you. Should they not be doing that? Do you know people in the church that do not give their lives to Jesus, but somehow think, well, when I have a problem, I should be able to pray to him and he should snap too. This is a convoluted relationship here. Notice this with the elders. They know Jesus can heal this guy, but they don't believe in Jesus. Kind of amazing, right? <laughs> That's amazing unbelief, okay? So anyway, moving on to the centurion's humble heart of faith. Because he has a humble heart of faith, we're going to see... he. He's open to this incredible insight of a divine sovereignty way of seeing things. He comes seeking grace, not demanding his rights. I'm not worthy, he says, to have you come under my roof. Now, this is interesting. He does not use legal, public discourse, governmental language the way that Luke has the elders using it. He uses a totally different term when he says, I'm not worthy. Ooh, that's just the negative, hikanos. It's like, I'm, I'm viscerally, I'm relationally, I, I can't even play in your league, Jesus. I'm not even in your league, is what he's saying. I don't even belong near to you. That, that's what he's saying. I, I don't fit with you. He's a Gentile. He's a mortal. You're dealing with somebody who somehow is connected with God. He knows that much. Uh, we remember this term, same term, Luke 3, verse 16. John the baptizer says, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy. Ukikanos, same term. I'm not worthy to untie the straps of his sandal. I'm not even in your league. John knows that. The centurion knows it. If you're a Bible person, you may be kind of itching on your memory here, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you this one too from Luke. We'll get to this much later in this series. The, the, the parable of the prodigal son, the father and the two sons. When the prodigal son rehearses what he's gonna to say to his daddy, and when he goes and says it to his daddy, both times, he's back to the legal language because he doesn't understand grace yet, okay? So he says, I am no longer worthy Uketi axios, the legal term, okay? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, your weas. So our centurion here is a humble man of grace. He's generous. People of grace are generous in the way they give financially. 
I'm just telling you, this is the way. To, I mean, people who are grace people from God give graciously. So he's been generous to Israel. Remember the promise to Abraham. Those who bless you, in other words, by extension, Israel, I will bless. But this guy has been gracious, generous to Israel, to the local synagogue. He's built it himself. I mean, that implies he not only paid for it, he probably organized the work crew on it. And he's been generous to the servant. He's in humble poverty before Jesus. And this leads to him having amazing faith and insight into something of Jesus' sovereign power. Now, is his theology fully formed? No, probably not. But he gets somehow that Jesus is from the heavenly realm and Jesus has authority to call down all the forces of heaven. He somehow gets that. God gives that to him. And so let's look at, this is, this is our model. He has total humility before Jesus, but at the same time, Christian, I want you to hear this. He has bold faith to know what Jesus can do and to ask for it. See, don't stop at saying, I'm not worthy. You want to be unworthy before Jesus, but believe in him, trust in his love and grace, and ask for bold things. The centurion teaches us how to do both. Humility and bold faith in Jesus' sovereignty. Bold request for Jesus. Just say a word, and he'll be healed. That's awesome. I don't deserve it, but I know you can do it. So Jesus came to his own. His own didn't receive him, but to everyone who believed in Jesus, to all who received him and believed in the power of his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born again by God, by his spirit. It's awesome. So let's go to Jesus' way of seeing finally. Jesus has this heart of grace and humility at a different level, but kind of like the, the centurion. But notice this, the faithful seeking. That's Jesus' way of seeing. What I want you to know is Jesus, the faithful Savior, who seeks and finds everybody who belongs to him. This is the shepherd who will not stop until every sheep is brought home. You think you're lost from Jesus? He will find you. You think he's forgotten you? He will find you and bring you home. Notice this, 7 verse 9. Jesus says, have I found? Everybody see that? What is Jesus doing? He is seeking to find faith. Is he finding it in your household? If he is, he is with you in your household. Jesus seeks faith. He seeks those who believe in him. He seeks his own. The thesis of all of Luke's gospel, I believe, is Luke 19.10, what Jesus says at the house of Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. That's what he does. And Jesus finds faith in surprising people. I mean a centurion, a Gentile. Next, we're going to read about a widow. Really? Yeah, a widow. I mean, the, the least, the last, and the lost. Stephen Cole says, Nothing gladdens the Lord more than when a person has faith in him and his authority. And nothing saddens the Lord more than unbelief. So back to what we started with. How does Jesus assess your faith? Ask, you, ask yourself this. How does Jesus assess my heart right now? Astounding unbelief? Amazing faith somewhere in the middle. I've got it as homework for you. It's at the bottom of the notes here. Take this home and expand it out to your journal or whatever you write on or your tablet, whatever. What is my prayer and my life commitment to God's gift of growing powerful faith in me? Spend time with the Lord this afternoon, tomorrow, seeking his gift 
of saving and life-changing faith to work powerfully in you. Your life will never be the same. Your family will never be the same. The world lights up with faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.